You're welcome back. Um, the, the World Bank is uh, on the news or in the news uh, for a lot of reasons, uh, or maybe the same reason with a different perspective or different sides of the story. Uh, but we have the World Bank saying that NNPCL is not transparent enough. We have the same World Bank advising Nigeria that they should raise tax, they should raise uh, VAT uh, for everybody and uh, tax for SMEs, which are the small and medium scale industries. And then the World Bank is also backing Tinubu's reforms. Uh, they project 3.5% economic growth. And we have uh, with us here this morning to discuss this, um, Mr. Bolahon Olojede, and uh, he's a public affairs analyst. Good morning, and welcome to the program, Mr. Olojede. Thank you very much. Good morning. Nice to be here. Only the same, the same World Bank, as we will say in Nigeria. Only them, <laughs> now them say, uh, EFC, um, NNPCL is not transparent. Our tax, we should raise it up. VAT, we should raise it up. Tax, SMEs more, and all that. And then they are saying that the economic reforms of the Tinubu administration uh, are very good, and they are projecting 3.5% economic growth. What is your take? Well, that's a lot of uh, information out there. Um, number one, on the NMPC not being transparent. Uh, it is not news. NMPC has never really been as transparent as we would have loved them to be. As a matter of fact, um, I, I still remember vividly that some years ago, for several years, NMPC did not even have an account that is audited. So nobody even knew the position of anything that was going on at NMPC. Um, it was recently, uh, I think under Miller here, uh, that issues around uh, having an audited account that at least shows what is going on and you know, what is going on um, came into place and, and some element of transparency started to come uh, into that space. Uh, way back in 1976 or something, when OBJ came, one of the very first things he has to deal with was the, so, the, the 2.8 million billion dollars that was said to be missing in NMPC. That was 1976 or 77, I believe. Uh, we remember the IBB's Gulf War windfall. Uh, the Gulf War windfall, or the $2.8 billion, both of them were never fully explained till today. Uh, beyond that are the issues around, oh, subsidy payments and Mr. Jonathan's era. Uh, a lot of subsidy were paid to some marketers and all the rest. Uh, most of those issues were also never really brought to a clinical close in the real sense of it. Um, I, I still remember 1993 speech by M.K. Wabiola. Uh, one of the things he said in that particular presidential comment or speech uh, was that NMPC was not transparent and that under his regime, it would make NMPC more transparent. So we are actually now hearing something new um, about the transparency of NMPC. And the challenge is at the doorstep of NMPC and the decision makers to continually pursue transparency for that institution. Because uh, a lot of our wealth is tied to the performance and activities of NMPC. So World Bank, maybe we can take it as a reminder that World Bank is reminding us that NMPC can do more with issues of transparency. Yeah, my, my um, problem, my concern, my concern, yeah. Mr. Olojide, is that um, a, a body that knows that NNPC is not transparent is now advocating that uh, uh, the, the price for fuel be raised and all that. Now, we're, we don't know what is happening in the subsidy removal, how much money we have, and all that, the, uh, the, that has to be or that all that is around that. And they are still telling us that the way to go is to raise fuel price and all that. It's, it's like still enriching a body that we do not know how it operates. Uh, unfortunately, that is not the way it goes. Part of what could actually help transparency in NMPC is that subsidy matter. Um, I, I, I work at the oil and gas industry at a very senior level. 
and I have a clear understanding of some of those issues around subsidy. And I, I will just sum it up as a dark hole of unaccountability. The more elements of it are retained the way it has been, uh, um, the more we sustain that dark hole. So one of the things that need to be dealt with is the subsidy and the subsidy administration in NMPC. So I want to believe that that is what uh, uh, um, uh, World, World Bank, Bank is hitting at. The, the target of World Bank, I don't believe, is that, oh, I want to punish the people, just increase the coil price. No, 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 no. It is an admission of the fact that the subsidy regime has been a very horrible, dark hole of unaccountability that nobody could say exactly this is how it goes. Because of subsidy matters, We don't have much oil. We consume it. Um, it is not because we cannot figure out how much oil. It is wrapped around issues of subsidy. You need to keep it dark. Keep the subsidy there and keep it dark. So that is what World Bank is referring to. World Bank is not interested in saying punish the people by just increasing uh, oil price. Yeah, they so, may, they may uh, not be they, saying that, but but at the end of the day, is that not exactly what will happen? Well, it might lead to that. Coal price might increase. It might also go down because the biggest component in coal price is actually the price of food. So we are in a season where for the past three years or, or, or thereabout, coal price has been on, 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 on a steady high or even on an increase at some point. Since we got out of uh, 2020 when uh, we had COVID, Oil price has been on the on the rise or on a steady high price. So we are not in a season where there is a likelihood that if you remove the subsidy, that the foil price will go down. No, most likely it will go up. But here is what we, what has also been established over the years. It is the fact that foil price does not remain permanently up. It is cyclical. And that period when it will go down will eventually come again. It has come over and over again. So in those prices, in those seasons, when the price of the largest input into the refined product goes down, it is expected that the retail price of the refined product will also go down. Okay, so what does that mean for Nigerians? Because now the World Bank is saying um, it should be increased to about 750 mm. per liter. And as of right now, some, some gas stations are selling for, I think, 590 something, some of them 611. But if it rises. That is in Lagos. Yes, in Lagos, but in, all, in other states, yes, it's even more expensive. So now, if, if it goes to 750 per liter, and if possible, um, maybe 1,000 per liter, what does that even do for the, the common man in Nigeria? Because now, a lot of things are dependent on this fuel subsidy that has been removed. For instance, transportation, um, alternative power. You know, a lot of people depend on this. So what is, what is that going to even do for the economy and for people who are supposed to be making ends meet with this same commodity? For me, that is part of the transparency that we're talking about. Um, you, you threw in a number now. You said 750 or something. And the question is, how did we arrive at it? The way the prices itself are going to be arrived at should not be a top secret. There are variables that go into determining what should be the appropriate price or what should be the market price for a product. Can we be transparent about it? This is the cost. This is the uh, 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 other variable. This is transport. This is this, this is that. This is the tax. And then we can arrive at a particular price. For me, that should not be a secret. As a matter of fact, what I would like to see is that the transparency will rise to a level that anybody who is interested enough can already know when oil price is going to increase or when it will go down without waiting for government to make any announcement. Should there even be an announcement by government? Mm -hmm. Is it not the market that that to determine that, oh, I am an importer, I bought a product for 100 naira, I want to make 10% gain, therefore, I will be selling it at 110. That should be market determined. It shouldn't even be an announcement by government. Mm -hmm. But where we are right now, where government had remained 
Um, I, I don't want to say the sole importer because I think there have been a few people who are tired to import. But the major, maybe 90% mm -hmm. of what we have is still being imported by government. And there are dollar related issues. We have FX supply issues. Um, so government will still be in that middle. But government can be more transparent about what is going on. Government also needs to pursue the alternative energy uh, possibilities that are available. Yeah. PMS is not the only energy source that is available. There is the CNG, there is the LPG. We are a gas country. So revving up on the activities of the government to push other energy sources other than PMS is something we need to look at and, 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 and fast track and make it happen. So if we have alternative energy that are even more efficient and cheaper than mm. PMS, and are being offered in the market, why won't people gravitate towards those cheaper alternatives? Okay, let's look at the crux of the matter. Now, having established uh, what the problem in, in Nigeria is, the economy, uh, what it is likely going to face and all that, this projection of the World Bank for 3.5%, is it realizable knowing what we are facing as a country? knowing that we have almost a mono-economy that is dependent on oil alone, and these things are happening, do you think the economy will grow as it has been projected to 3.5%? To be honest with you, 3.5% is low. Um, we need growth levels that are much higher than that. So if we can do 3.5%, uh, it won't take us to... I, I know the government has been saying something about a, a trillion, a trillion uh, dollar economy. Uh, Three point five percent will not take us to a trillion to a trillion dollar economy uh, in seven years. It is too small. But if we work at it, we probably can achieve it. And what do I mean by work at it? Let us have a disciplined approach to the implementation of policies that are going to drive this economy. I'll give you an instance. If you look at our inflation numbers, you will see the food inflation as an arrowhead driving this inflation, composite inflation figure. So when you have an inflation number of 27.3 or 27.6, you when you look at food inflation alone, it will be about 30 point something. Mm. There is a message there. That message is saying that food is a major problem driving inflation. How about we do something about that major driver that is out there and do it with discipline and in time? Two, uh, three, three I, months are you ago. Sure? Well, are, you, are you sure it's not the, the egg and the, the chicken problem <laughs> here we're finding? Uh, is, you are saying it is food that is the problem. The farmers who produce this food will tell you that is the fuel and every other thing that and is... And even transportation, yeah, that transporting is, the food to yeah, the so, cities. So now you're saying it's the food. How do you tackle the food where you're not tackling the things that are making the food to go high? The dollar, for instance, that enables the farmers get the fertilizers and other farm inputs and all that is high. And then you're talking about fuel that you need to transport this thing to the market is high and so many other things. And now if you concentrate on the food, will you succeed? Yeah, because what you need to do is analyze exactly what are the issues in that space that is driving your inflation. And what are the intervention measures that you can do? Is okay. it fertilizers? What can I do to make fertilizers readily okay. available yeah. to the farmers at the price that they can afford? Is it transportation? The government, this, the government incidentally, has spoken about rural roads, which means that it has an understanding that connecting the centers of production to where these farm produce are going to be consumed is a major issue because of infrastructure. Mm. So connect them. We need to move away from the talk to walking the talk. If you are going to do additional 500,000 hectares of cultivation, get it started. Let it move away from the speech of the president and get it onto the land where those aqua production will happen. That is disciplined execution. Whatever is hampering those production, whatever is hampering them from getting to the market, deal with it and you will be dealing with the food matter. When people are able to eat, almost half of their problems are solved. Mm. 
True. Well, true. True, I agree. Um, however, the World Bank has commended President Bolotinubo on the reforms um, so far. And then they've said that as long as we can keep driving this momentum of the reforms, um, we would see that 3.5%. But for me, I mean, seeing the, 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 what we are facing now as a nation, I think it's okay for me to be pessimistic that we might not even be able to get there. So what, what how, like what are the driving factors, aside you know, tackling the food inflation, mm -hmm. what, are the, what are other factors that we know that would help us, that would drive us to that 3.5%, which you've actually, actually said is quite low, because um, it's, I think it's 3.5% in three years, so we're looking at till 2026, and then we'd have that growth of 3.5%. But what are other factors that would even make us surpass the 3.5% if we're looking at the trillion um, dollar economy? Okay, um, there are policy issues. Uh, the government has been talking about a number of policies. It is in the place of being able to execute those policies, pursue them to the logical end. I'll give you an example. One of the things that this administration did when it came on board was to set up a committee on tax and fiscal policies. Now, one of the problems in the nation is our tax system. So you have a situation in which there are all sort of taxes everywhere. I think some numbers were being thrown around, maybe about 50 or 60 different taxes. Now, when you are in that kind of an environment as a business, you are not encouraged, and you are most of the time paying extortion, not even tax. Mm -hmm. Some people will come here and say, oh, come and pay us this one. You look at the thing, it is too big. You said. I can't pay you this one, or you come by the side. Let me give you this small thing for your own pocket. And the guy takes it and walks away. That is extortion. That is not even taxation. Yeah. But part of what that committee is meant to do is streamline the taxes. So maybe you're taking it from 50 different taxes to 10. And then the payments, the administration side of things, the tax administration, make it easier. So you encourage the people to want to pay their taxes because they were paying 50 taxes before. Now they have 10 to deal with. The channels for making the payment on this debt is clear and easy. These are part of what will help businesses. It will also help us to deal with issues of double taxation. Someone mm. is saying, look, I'm a producer. I've paid tax on this one at this junction. You ask me to pay tax at this junction again. By the time I put together all these taxes, am I really making profit? Yeah. So that committee will have to deal with matters of double taxation. That's a policy area. And one of the policy areas is also in the FX issue. If you look at what has been happening with the big companies, you see manufacturers have suffered a great deal this year. Though the, the banks are the banks are, have made a whole lot of money on their own part because there are two segments, two different segments of the economy. And it, it is as if the woes of one segment has become the, the return of the other side. Mm -hmm. What happened to the manufacturers? It is the FX problem. It is the FX problem. So the policy around FX, how we can increase the supply of FX, how we can deal with matters that are draining our FX, how we can get transparent with the issue of policy around Forex administration. These are all policy issues. And being able to pursue them with the right level of discipline is those are the things that will assure this 3.5% growth that we're talking about. And I'm even saying 3.5%, yeah, it, it doesn't really cut it, but maybe that is the best we can get. Hmm. All right. Okay. Well, <laughs> I don't know. Um, all these things you have said, I, I hope they will, they, will, they will adhere to them. And from the body language and everything that you have seen, do you think uh, they will be disciplined enough to do what you have proposed? even if they know these things? Um, for me, I've seen certain discipline, especially from the CBN side of it. Um, certain policy pronouncement, certain uh, secular issuance that shows some elements of discipline. I've also seen certain acts of government that I believe um, does not portray uh, efficiency uh, of the bureaucracy. Um, the, the, recent, the most recent one was the COP28 attendance. So um, when, when a government is trying to elicit the support of the people, say, look, 
I'm taking you people somewhere. But you see, I need you to make certain sacrifices so that we can arrive at that destination that I'm taking you. The people also want to see you as a government making the same sacrifice. Yeah. That was not what we saw with the attendance at Hope 28. A country that is uh, in the kind of financial situation that we are, did not need foreign and something people representing the government and a total of one point federal government and a total of 1.4 million or thereabout representing the country to go and do what exactly? When did we become such a passionate country about issues of environment? If we are passionate about issues of environment, we should start from the Niger Delta, mm -hmm. not from speech and from attendance and that are, that that, that will, uh, attend to uh, attendance of COP20. So issues around those inefficiency and portrayal of profligacy are things that the government must watch out for and ensure that we don't put ourselves in those corners. Okay. Uh, Mr. Gola, uh, Mr. Lodjede, we thank you so much for coming on the show. And as usual, uh, we had some insight into things that we may not have known. For instance, I thought 3.5% was so much growth. Yeah. Uh, well, even though I know the yeah, president said that he was projecting 6%, yeah. but now they said 3.5%. Ah, the World Bank is saying that. And now you're saying it's so low. It's make it makes it we should be more, more ambitious. More scary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we should be more. Thank you so much for being a part of our program this morning. Thank you, sir. Thanks for having me. Thank you. We've been talking to Mr. Bolahon Olojide, public affairs analyst, and uh, we're going to take a short break now. When we return, we'll be looking at the second half topic. Stay with us.